do comic book relaunches matter? Meaning, if you're going to have a new creative team, you're going to want a sales burst. Do you have to relaunch? Well, the short answer is no. Um, it's been proven over and over again that you can have a creative team shift in the middle of a book. You can have a big initiative or big arc, and it will pick up sales just as well as if you relaunch it as a new number one. So why do people keep doing this? And is relaunching just always a bad idea? No, it's not always a bad idea, but it is a confusing topic. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, relaunching comics is a is a you know it's a time honored tradition. It's definitely something that uh, is has grown over time. For a long time in the '80s, I think, and in the '90s to to large extent, um, there was this feeling that you built up equity in a comic book if you kept producing it. If, if the numbers grew up higher, if you know you had a long run that it produced equity in the book and it made customers less likely to cancel it and they became hooked customers. It's, it's a similar approach to how a lot of uh, MMO games were, where there'd be so many giveaways, so many collectibles, that customers would keep paying for the subscription to the MMO, even though they no longer played it anymore, simply because they didn't want to lose all of that good that they've gotten inside the game. Comic books are a little bit like that. It, it was the idea that if you break the run, that you were losing value in your comics somehow. Even if you weren't really a collector, you were still losing this mental value. And so comic companies, uh, publishers avoided it for a very, very long time. And then publishers realized kind of simultaneously that if you launched a title as a new, brand new number one, it enjoyed a very healthy sales bump. A lot of publishers watched what Image did in the 90s around a bunch of new number ones, and they thought, hey, we want in on this. Let's, let's do some number ones ourselves. And the uh, heroes were born. Uh, the Avengers books and uh, Captain America, Iron Man, that the, uh, the image uh, Jim Lee and, and Rob Liefeld and others came over and did, um, sold really, really well as new number ones. They were, they were hot and they were popular. And then that, the 90s kind of blew all that up. The speculator bubble burst and, and the collector, uh, the, whole, the whole collector market kind of dissipated to some extent. And that was the end of kind of this, this feeling that, you know, number ones were, had to be a sure thing. So you had a bunch of number ones launch after that, that really, you know, they, they, they sold well or not, depending on the creative team that was attached to it. Uh, number one issues always had a bit of a sales bump, but the conventional logic, both at the retailer level and at the publisher level toward the late nineties was that the sales bump you'd get off that number one was not as valuable as keeping the run going and potentially breaking customers. That the, the drop from issue one to issue 10 was high enough that you actually you got lost equity in the line rather than just keep it going. Um, then in 2000s, we saw a bit of a different approach. And we saw it both at Marvel and DC simultaneously where almost the, the opposite uh, psychology came in very, very hard to say, no, no. Uh, we want number one issues relaunching all the time. Let's really put our marketing dollars behind those number one issues and those and the and events. And that's how we're going to make a bulk of our money. And an interesting thing happened. Uh, so many relaunches occurred in such a short period of time that when you took a look at the yearly numbers, you could point to a strong amount of business coming from either events or number one relaunch issues. The problem with all that was that you were doing so much of it that you're kind of almost creating a, a false positive. You, you, you didn't have a lot of historical data to compare it to. And the number ones were kind of dubiously propped up with variant covers and, and incentive schemes and other things to go along with it. This is what Axel Alonso, David Gabriel, um, or David Gabriel really kind of you know promoted at Marvel at the time. And, and DC followed suit with their new 52 and a lot of all that. And, and so you, you kind of created the story you wanted to tell. The story that people wanted to tell was these long uh, runs, this historical you know, uh, run uh, does not have equity. It doesn't really matter. And you know, the, the people, the collectors aren't buying comics that way. It was a very dramatic shift from the 90s to the 2000s where uh, that, that really took hold. And it, it coincided with a lot of new 
kind of higher level management people within Marvel and DC who, who definitely were pushing that agenda. And I think today, if you look at a lot of the angst that really started to pick up in comics around 2014 to 2018 or so, um, this is kind of one of those topics. You know, a lot of people complain about relaunches and renumbering, but there's something behind it. It's a psychology behind it of do comic runs, uh, does comic continuity, do creative teams, do does that kind of stability and that kind of effort, um, does that create equity in the book? I keep using that word equity because I think that's where the battle lines were formed of, you know, does this comic, um, you know, does this stuff matter or not? And a lot of people going with the not. Um, and and that, that irritated fans. If you look at a lot of the angst around, you know, changing out characters, social agendas, uh, creative teams, etc., things people said on social media, if you dig really down into the heart of it, it's a battle over the psychology of do these, you know, does continuity, do runs, do, you know, does, is there equity in history or does none of it really matter? And, you know, you can reinvent the history every year. Certainly the, you can reinvent history every year plays well to people newer to Marvel and DC. It allows them a chance to make their own mark without being encumbered by continuity and history. It allows them more freedom. To, to write. Some would argue it, it allows them to be lazier because they don't have to look into what happened in the past. They can kind of just invent the future, you know, the way they see fit. Um, and I don't think, but I don't think it's always a laziness issue. I, I don't, I think there are a lot of reasons why, you know, creative writers, especially uh, freelance coming in will want to tell their own story and not have to be bound by somebody else's writing. I think that's a legitimate idea. Um, but at the same time, um, that continuity is, and that history is value. It is equity. And it is funny because um, the, the comic industry, like I said, really understood that very, very well through the 90s. And any retailer will tell you that today, by the way, that um, even though they too see a sales bump from number one issues and gimmicks and other things, they would far prefer a long run of a comic that has a loyal subscriber base that comes in just month after month because that's guaranteed revenue. That's guaranteed customers. And that's, that's safer. Customers you can predict are much better than, than risky customers you don't. The big voices at the retailer level who say, ah, renumbering and relaunching doesn't really matter, tend to be groups that you know, were never big Marvel or DC shops, tended to be more indie or bookstore flavor comic groups that... Um, you know, that it didn't matter to them. And if it didn't matter to them, then, you know, it should matter to anyone. It's kind of how the logic would go. But the reality is, um, you know, I think that there's plenty of historical evidence out there to show that, yes, renumbering isn't as dramatic and drastic as some might make it out to be. Um, it isn't the end of the world, but there is an erosion of, you know, customer support over time. I think there's enough data that you could say that definitively. Some might argue but I think if you take the runs and you play them out over 10 years and you look at the, the relaunches and the bumps and you remove the gimmicks, the, the overships or the, or the incentive programs, and you just went with the hard numbers, I think you see over time that the um, erraticness of the sales is either lower than the consistent, you know, just, just single numbering sales, or it is so erratic that if you're a retailer or even a reader trying to figure out what you should purchase, what you should stock, the quantities you should order, it creates a lot more um, uh, waste. It creates uh, retailers buying things that they can't sell. It creates a lot of uh, churn that is unhealthy ultimately for books. And over time, as it plays out, retailers just order less because they don't want to be on the roller coaster of sales. And that's, that's what renumbering really does. It creates that roller coaster you know, with highs and lows, but the lows are probably not worth the highs over time. I think that's that's how it plays out, how that logic plays out. Anyway, what do you think? Does renumbering really bother you? Do you care? Do you understand why relaunches uh, happen? They don't, they don't, they're not required. Um, there are sometimes benefits to it if you're doing something really profoundly new and it makes sense. But then I think you're, you're back to the psychology of what you're trying to do with the comic in the first place. And that's where the decision gets made. But what do you think? Leave me a comment below. would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. Like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications if you care to. Follow me on Twitter or Facebook at Comic Perch. And thanks for listening.